Alex Jimenez. At long last, I am joined today in the Tales from the Fintech Crypt by a member of the infamous Fintech Mafia think tank. It does exist, I can tell you that. We are a very small group that has been speaking to each other and commenting on the industry for the last 10, 12 years. Alex is someone who is not only a dear friend, but his warm and intensely human view of the industry we work in has inspired me and many others throughout the years. Where others are shackled by wooden language or afraid to say the real truth, Alex um, doesn't abide by that small thinking and you'll read his thought leadership pieces and find them reimagined through novel and sharp perspective. And also you'll be able to sense how he has put genuine thought into each aspect he's commenting on. A banker, an analyst, a speaker and financial industry voice with a focus on the US market, Alex is someone whose perspective you often miss if you want to arrive at any clarity within fintech. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tales from the Fintech Crypt. I have Alex Jimenez with us today, and I am looking forward to this conversation. We've been planning it for quite a while. I think um, anyone who has read Alex before or heard Alex speak before knows that he is not afraid to tell it like it is. So I'm hopeful that we're going to get to the bottom of what Fintech is. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you for, thank you for accepting my invite. Of course, Absolutely. Thanks. thanks for having me. We've known each other for a long, long time, so it it it's we always have good to we chat have finally you. caught up because it's been a minute. But we have known each other for I think probably fifteen years now, uh, as long as long as there has mm -hmm. been fintech, right? <laughs> yeah, I had hair when you when you first yeah, met that me. That is so, very yeah. true. <laughs> I had forgotten that. But uh, you you don't look a day older. Um, none of us do. We just look much wiser. I was told by Alessandro Hatami the other day, so I'm sure that's true. So going back to those uh, those yeah, we'll those that. days of, of of hair and and hope, um, what would you say was the absolute first time you felt like you were in uh, the industry, and what did the industry mean to you at the time? Well, I, I've been in, in the banking industry for 30-something years, but uh, the the world of fintech uh, really, uh, I think the first time I felt I was in it was uh, 2011 at a Finnovate in New York City. Uh, and that was in the days where Finnovate was uh, a totally new thing. And, uh, yeah, and, and it was nothing but demos. And I was super excited coming out of there. My boss, who was the CTO of the bank that I worked at, and I were there. And we both of us came out with all kinds of ideas, which <laughs> some of them have panned out. Some of them died in the vine. And some of, them, some of them are long forgotten. I think that's a really good point. And I think maybe we should we should give people a, um, a taste of that. Because we have talked about, we have referenced Finnovate on, on this show multiple times before. I think it's seminal for the industry. I did write about it in, in my book, um, Emotional Banking, because I think that's where a lot of the things we see today have, have really started. But um, that's key that what, what Alex was saying earlier, which is, Finovate was a series of demos. You had a thing, you had made a thing, you were coming to show how that thing was going to change the financial industry, which is obviously massively different than anything that has a deck and um, and the PowerPoint in it. So those days were, were that's kind of what was powering the, the excitement, wasn't it? That you could see a thing happening. Yes, yeah. And of course, you know, there were things that were happening at the time. Mobile particularly was a, a new form. A lot of us were playing with the first few versions of either a, uh, a Google phone or a Apple phone. And a few people were, were also playing with a Windows phone, if you remember. There were even Palm uh, attempts at Palm apps for, for banking. I remember these two banks trying that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so it was all exciting. It was also early days of crypto. So everyone was thinking crypto was going to change banking and investments. And, you know, 10 years from now, everything will be all about Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, no one will be using computers. Everyone will be on mobile devices, blah, blah, blah. Some of those, some of those things happen, but... I mean, I, crypto is like this, right? It has to keep going up and down, up and down. And 
uh, the effect is, has not been what we thought of, you know, back in but 2011. But there was so much that we had to change at that point, and uh, a lot of those conversations were going um, quite deep in the in the in the actual concept of what money was. Which, let's face it, we don't much do these days much right. anymore. But kind of, if you remember what what David Birch was was <laughs> on and on about in terms of money and digital identity back in the day, those were genuine moments of. But this is a deep consideration. So, of course, on the bed of that, the idea that crypto was going to completely revolutionize was 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 everywhere. But I think we're jumping ahead. It's taken us. I don't even remember crypto until like halfway into our journey. I think the very the the most advanced things in Finovate <laughs> at first were obviously um, ways to show what you are doing with your money. They were the hundreds of copies of mm-hmm. Mint people were attempting to produce here and there. The colors yes. and the, oh God, the personalization. Do you remember the big two or three years of personalization craze where everyone and their dog was going yes. to give you this one credit card that was going to have your dog's face on it. And that was going to revolutionize uh, financial services. It was lovely, lovely beginnings of, of time. That, that reminds me of the uh, the one card to rule them all, right? Everything was going to be on a single card. I know that people are still trying to do that, but that never panned out. I don't know how many of those companies came and, and went with the idea of <laughs> load up all your cards into this card. And, you know, now we just load them up on the phone. <laughs> you don't need a, a card to do that. Or for that matter, even you don't even need cards anymore. So uh, some of those things kind of changed. I remember a lot of mobile payment solutions. Uh, and because, you know, the, the even with the iPhone, Apple <laughs> wouldn't turn on their, their NFC chip, mm-hmm. which just happened, right? The, they, they just turned it on for third party vendors. But because of that, there were all kinds of ideas. I remember one that we worked with a vendor and we were about weeks to to go live with it. And then the company went under. It was the sticker you put in the back of your of your phone, and then you you and that had the, had the chip, and you could pay for that. But then the uh, the uh, to be able to do that, you had to sign up all the merchants, and that was the big challenge. I think we had signed up like three or four merchants that were going to test it. But, uh, you know, we signed the contract. We actually never paid anything because the vendor went under before we even got a chance to pay. So there were probably tens of thousands of companies that were, were having super out of the box and very cute and demure um, solutions that were... They were hardware based <laughs> more than they were software based. And later on, as a, as a, yes. as a startup bootcamp mentor and, and Techstars mentor, I have seen even more of these. And it, it really always bedays me how courageous people would be to attempt to make an add on hardware solution to our existing digital issues. But that is where we were. And that was happening on, on the outside, whereas on the inside of banks, the, the 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 current wasn't quite there, so these were all workarounds for those of us listening to us that don't don't quite understand why all of that would be happening. It's because it was the wild wild west of innovation, and everyone was attempting to go around what they were seeing as these mammoths not moving fast enough. But were you a banker when it all hit then? Right. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then of course, then there was the wave of innovation within banks. So I was the head of innovation in a bank and, you know, there were many people like me around the industry trying to bring innovation in organizations that wanted to spend on innovation, but it it just didn't fit the model. So, you know, what a story that I like to tell is the, uh, my CEO at some point had asked me, you know, to present, how do we change the culture inside the bank to be more innovative and so on. And I made the mistake of using the the break things and and learn fast and he, he was very upset with me he called me to his office and he said we do not fail fast at this bank we just don't i'm not i'm not a person that can very quickly respond to a comment like that i was like oh all right okay i get it and then and then a couple of days later i was like wait a minute what do you mean we don't fail fast of course we fail fast and we fail all the time 
because we we actually budget for charge ups, we actually budget for losses. So we we are there planning mm. to fail for some things. Why can't we put that into the realm of innovation? But that really just kind of crystallizes the challenge, right? If you wanted to be an innovator in an organization that had a very old mindset, you couldn't just have you know, just delegate it to a guy or a lady mm. and say, okay, go do innovation. Call mm-hmm. us when you have an innovation. It's got to be kind of the part of the organization. It, it is now that I'm actually seeing more, more people who are innovative within mm. the construct of the bank and are actually having right. day jobs, right? You know, the head, the head of something other. Right. Treasure management. Right, uh, who's bringing innovations to treasure management? The head of mortgage, who's bringing innovations to mortgage. So it, it's taken it's taken over a decade for that to happen, but it really has. The reason for that is really mm-hmm. from being more generational. So as the boomers start leaving the industry, <laughs> and the millennials and Gen Xers start moving into into positions of power, that's when when innovations seem to be happening. Uh, not to right. say that some boomers were not innovating, but uh, but. <laughs> That seems to be the case, but that's not what we we, we thought back. In I mean, I don't even know where to start. I have a hundred things to say about that and to ask you about that because from the outsiders, we were, <laughs> if you wish, on like the the two different sides of this, right? You were on the inside of the bank, and we would be on the outside of the bank, kind of trying to find these inside advocates mm-hmm. that could drive change and have. Uh, developed such incredible empathy for people who have attempted to move innovation so severely burnt out than in other industries today, many of which. And then the ones that have those those big, big changes are many of them very unsung heroes, unfortunately, whereas I think they should have been uh, Mount Rushmore with with statues of their immense efforts. But I, I also think that, and I say this a lot to anyone listening, the learnings of being an entrepreneur and the what it takes to do that and what it takes to kind of to to battle the the beast you're in the belly of is it cannot be underestimated <laughs> and at the times that people would be like we 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 were powered because it was fun and it was exciting and like i said the wild wild west of innovation had all of these these new gadgets that were interesting but it was also heartbreaking to see what what drama some hsbc yeah. uh heads of innovation would go through and so on. But yeah, it's been quite a... Yeah, and, and and so there's people like me who were in the industry, we're in banks and we're no longer banks. <laughs> and part of the reason for that is, hey, you know, having to sell the idea of innovation or digital or transformation over and over and over again to the same people, it just gets the, tiring. The and so, you know... Uh, yeah, I mean, we still are doing, I'm, I'm still doing that, but I'm doing that from the outside. I'm, I'm doing that with, generally, I'm doing that with our clients who are generally looking for new things and are looking to, to, to change the, you don't have to make the mm-hmm. plan for why you need to change. It's really why you need to choose us. It's a different, different, different story, uh, as opposed to continue to, to say, Hey, we got to do this. We got to do this. You know, one of the banks that I worked at at some point said, "Hey, we're done with we're we're done with with uh, digital transformation." Thank you, Alex. Go find a job elsewhere. Hey. Which is kind of silly because the whole idea of transformation is not digital specific; it's a transformation of the industry and of the business model. It's something that is it. just going to continue. You, you don't finish it. You, you don't say, hey, we did the five-year plan and now we're done with your with five-year plan and you did everything you right. said five years ago, which is exactly what happened to me. It's, you know, we got to keep going. We get we got to bring is- new things. Uh, I so, didn't mean to that, but we would just get agitated. Yes. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, so, you know, now, now is just finding finding those organizations that want to, that are really actively looking for solutions. And that's what I do now. So it's different. Ironically, Alex works now for a company who used to be my competitor back in the day. We we used to, to push kind of the same things to the yes. industry. So we've been, he knows exactly what I'm saying now from the inside, but the wheel of innovation, if you wish, and kind of the, the worst stories we've seen, I think I must have been, I was counting with, with a friend the other day in maybe a hundred innovation labs and departments of various banks. And the one thing they most commonly had in common was the green 
wall, the living green wall. If you didn't have a little bit of moss or, or, or grass on your wall, then you were clearly not an innovation space. And two, two of that, these places the uh, were in a panic over the years because they, they they couldn't keep it alive. And it was one of the key problems they had in the innovation lab is that the grass was dying as well. Um, wow. a, a lot of money was put in one of them to do that, much more than they spent to buy PFM at the time. But that's that's a different story. The stories we've seen where it's just human folly at its best when you're trying to make big, big things happen and that uh, gets stopped by the masses of many business prevention departments to quote to JP Nichols, I shall always and forever attribute him on on the on the on the genius label of but that is what it felt like. They were inside places who were literally put in place to just stop you from, from moving ahead. So I, I'm always um, hats off to anyone who's done innovation from the inside. I have had a short stint being an entrepreneur in a big beast, and it has been absolutely uh, traumatic and horrendous. And I know what you've been through. But um, <laughs> in those times, and kind of as you went along, what would you say were kind of the vision of ahead? What was going to be the, the holy grail of what banking and, and, and relationing with one's money was going to be like? And how far are we from that view? Well, I mean, uh, back in 2011, uh, all of us were, were saying that branches were, were going to be alive for five years and that's it. They won't, they won't go beyond that. So clearly we were wrong because <laughs> we still have them. We continue to close branches. We continue to open branches <laughs> as well. Uh, you know, and then, and then, you know, and that brought a whole bunch of problems that we never actually really thought through. You know, just recently I was reading in uh, Lloyd's is closing a whole bunch of branches in, in the UK. And there's some towns that just don't have any branches left, which as an American, seems really weird because we have so many branches in the U.S. But it's the same thing in Spain. Uh, you know that there are lots of small towns that just don't have any branches. And that's the, mm. you know that impacts the 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 older clients that just are never <laughs> going to go into digital. We'll never use an app. You know now that now they have to you know somehow get. Mm. To the next town over for uh, to do their banking. So you know we were we were pretty ridiculous back then, thinking that that was going to go away as quickly a, a, as that. I think I particularly didn't have a grand vision of where banking was going because I really thought I then that it was just mm -hmm. going to to change. Uh, and, and you know, and we were going to move all the banking to your mo mobile phone, and then it'll going to be moved to your smart glasses and blah blah blah. So I was really more focused on the form than the actual. That the actual, but what it was going to look like, uh, uh, and some things are better than I thought would, they mm -hmm. would be in the in the future. But some things have just never have never caught on, and it, it, I think the whole idea of true, true, true personalization continues to be kind of something that we're all going uh, uh, towards. And now we're we're all saying, "Hey, AI is going to give us mm -hmm. that." personalization and a generative AI is going to be, you know, we're going to have an agent who's going to do all the banking for us. And then we don't even have to think about banking. I, there's a bit of a folly there. I don't know how it feels like it's going to be really soon, but I, I don't know. I, when I use Erica, which is Bank of America's AI bot, it's, it's way far away from, from what people think about true personalization. I have lots of bank accounts with yeah. a lot of banks in the U.S. and and I just don't see any of them doing true personalization. I, I still uh, like to do on my birthday is see how many of, of my banks send me a birthday message. And it's still a minority of the banks that I, that I have accounts with. You know, I have accounts maybe with 15, 20 banks only because of what I do. And maybe three or four That's actually really send me a message. For the, and the state of the bank maybe once, of those banks. Yeah. And maybe one of them actually gives me an offer. Hey, we're going to give you a, you know, have a basis point on this. That's that. really sad. In Which do doesn't that's move the needle. But that, that's, that must be, what that, that absolutely must be all due to this thing that I arrived at at the, the end of my fintech run, which was, this is all left because of... Yep human debt. This is what these organizations are incapable of working out. Um, so to me, it was like, I now know 
why huh. it's it's not that there's this big Kabbalah of Illuminati of, of CEOs of banks that go like, we shall not give people the things they need. <laughs> Equally, it did my head in for many, many years. Why would they not use the data they have in the ways that we're showing them so clearly and so easily to actually give people things that they want. I mean, all they would need to do is go to one Finnovate and they would come out of there knowing what to do. The reality of it is they all knew what to do, right? <laughs> There's absolutely no, even old guard CEO that didn't yeah. know where we were going or what would be necessary. But to do that internally in these big beasts was near impossible, as as, as you many times hear from, from us telling you the stories. Now, the, the delta between that oh, yeah. and what the consumer got is still, in my view, insanely big. It's it's a it's a shame and it's a pity and it yeah. covers us as an industry in shame that we haven't gotten much further when you know this easily at our fingertips. With that said, it's almost it's not even just because the banks are big and they have uh, you know human debt and tech debt galore, but because we've also proliferated mm-hmm. this industry around them that's a bubble of many, many things that are attempting to fix that. And now we have to all um, somehow make a living. So it's not surprising that it slowed, unfortunately, slowed them down even more. So, but even the, now, like looking yeah. at the things that in Maniga used to win Finnovate with, they don't exist in my bank or yours. And this is still the realm of, of science fiction for half of these things when they should have been, and they should have been easy. <laughs> but is that because, or oh, we know why that is, but, in terms of leaping ahead, because we know that sometimes you know, propositions just don't don't arrive in time, but when they do arrive, they arrive hopefully stronger. What do you think is genuinely big that's coming up? And and you know, with is it is it open banking? Is it don't tell me AI? Because we both know that's not the answer. So, what is the big thing that's going to really shake anything? Well. I don't think there's a big thing necessarily. I think personalization still to me is, is, is where I like organizations to go. And unfortunately, it is going to have to take some AI. It's going to have to take some data managing of data. I, I think to me, more powerful than anything is this whole idea of have just in time contextual recommendations, advice. Because you know what? For all of us who are in, in the financial services world, most people don't care most people don't want to bother. It's either scary to be thinking about money or boring to think about money. And there's other things more important or more fun to think about. So the whole idea that, you know, we're going to be spending a ton of time looking at our apps and, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that is not going to happen. It's really just how, how can we provide people with what they need when they need it? with real true advice and not things like, hey, maybe if you if you buy less Starbucks, you'll save some money. You know, those are ridiculous kind of things. But, you know, how do you how do you do that? And it, and it's difficult. And sometimes, you know, we kind of get bogged down on the idea. Well, for us to be able to do that, we, have, we need to have a real time modern core. And therefore, we're going to have to update our core. And, you know, 10 years later, we just did it. Right. And we spent a lot of effort doing that. Or, you know, we, we just need to we need to redesign our website. We need to redesign our, our 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 app. All of those things need to be done, but really, to serve the needs of of banking customers, it's got to be you know how do we just make their lives better? And you're not going to make their lives better by by uh, by updating our core system. It might might lead to that. Uh, it, it it's it it's a it, it's a difficult thing. Back, you know, 10 years ago, we, we thought, hey, if we gave everybody the power of data. We'll give them some pie charts and, uh, you know, all this PFM stuff. You know, all those, all those PFM things are fantastic. They're really the great th- for those of us that love that stuff. But consumers couldn't care less. The consumers are like, I don't care. I don't want to look at the pie chart. Just tell me how much money I have in my account. That's all I need to know. Uh, so, you know, we're... You know, we, we kind of get full of ourselves and think right. about the things that we would like as people in yeah. banking that either, you know, have an accounting degree, a finance degree, or a computer science degree. And we get really geek out and all that stuff. Right. But most people don't. Are, are not focused right. that way. So I don't think I answered <laughs> no, the question. I mean, yeah, but... To be fair, I mean, I spent 
a, a good three, four years just studying the idea of money moments and what is happening, what's the hold up, why can't we just make better mm-hmm. experiences for our for our customers. But again, the answer is because we don't have the mindset in organizations or the generative organizations that would be able to do that. But outside of that, it was also a question of, you know, kind of what do our customers or don't they want to have? And that is a conversation that didn't necessarily really happen in most places. And I, I remember some of the, the products, the early products that were both giving people the ability to geek out, like you said, on, on their data, but they were also, we've, we've also made things like, I remember we won Finovate one year with something called peace of mind banking, which was essentially taking all of the boring bit and putting it under the hood and doing it for you and getting you the best rates and making sure that you're saving here and there and so on. But equally, it was letting you do the things that were emotionally significant to you on top of it. If you think, game over, we've, we've got this, what else are we going to be doing? Surely that's the future of banking. We were still 10 years into it, and that doesn't much exist everywhere. Again, that goes back to whether or not we can apply these things in in banking. It also, like you say, very much depends on our vision of what this future should have been. And I think maybe going forward, and that's kind of really interesting to me, is I don't actually know, and I couldn't tell you how different the money moments that we were referring to back then, and we were attempting to study how little mm-hmm. human-centered design existed yep. anyway, are to what they are like right. today to the newer generation, and whether or not that's even a conversation, mm-hmm. because if you, I get a feeling that there's a, a lot more aversion towards the idea in general and of of kind of looking at finances in the way that we, we had it, so it might, might have changed. What do you reckon? Is, is the new generation going to be a... Finance geek, or are they going to be expecting things to have happened under the hood? I I don't know. I I I think it's I don't know. It, it's hard to tell. I, you know the the fact that there are TikTok influencers that talk about banking and give and, and give tips is an interesting one. And if you look at some of those. <laughs> Some of the tips are absolutely terrible, right? So, I mean, as an industry, we need to do a better job to talk to to Gen Zers and and, and Gen Alphas uh, and and uh, and let them understand what it is that that they should be doing. But you know, I, I see very few banks and fintechs actually using uh, TikTok, for example, as a way to 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 talk to their clients. There's a, a former client of mine, a fintech in Canada, that has a really great program where they have, um, you know, in-house influencers whose job is to go on TikTok. And that's what they do. They, and they talk to, they talk to their clients and their prospects about what they should be doing. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I mean, very few, very few I'd, love to, I'd love to get their, their name afterwards. I'd love to look into it. And it is bizarre because if you look at it, I think many yep. places have, even just taking this silly demure, not demure, um, moment um there has been i don't know if you've seen it but there has yes. been a bevy of of museums libraries um, administration offices you name it who have used this to kind of re and yes. it's an amazing thing it would have been a, a great time for every bank to jump on it and i kept hoping that one bank somewhere is gonna know because we are bankers and we are self-respecting and we're not going to be going there i suspect is the problem I'd love to see Lloyd's do a, a very good they should. Thing. I don't know why they wouldn't. I don't know why no one says in Lloyd's today. See, they said we should. So I hope they do. But um, there's just so much that, that needs uh, to, yeah. to to kind of rewrap itself in a sense. And you, you were mentioning earlier, and I think that's a very interesting point, that the, the guard has changed. It's something we touched on in other episodes of this, which is back in our day, the kind of the last outpost of desperation for any of us attempting to see transformation who weren't was at least at one point this old guard is going to change and we're going to have all new people in in organizations that are going to usher in change faster now if they did come in and they did the much younger people these days doing the things do we see them every day do you meet them every day Yeah, I, I don't know. That, that's a challenge, right? It's something we need to figure out as an industry and we haven't, I don't think we have. I see organizations talking about how do we engage with 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 uh, millennials and Gen Zers, but I don't see, I don't hmm. see a lot of action industry-wide. The other thing though I'm seeing is that the older, the, the, the parts of banks that are, that have moved slower. So I'm thinking about the uh, 
uh, commercial banking, uh, and corporate banking, they're starting to demand a lot of the stuff that, 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 you know, we used to demand, uh, you know, 10 years ago in retail, they, they want digital experiences. They want to be able to, to, to deal with banks, uh, in that, in, in that way, uh, the idea of, of a CFO at a company having to spend a whole afternoon with their banker playing golf does not necessarily translate to a younger, newer CFO who's saying, look, I don't have time with that. Maybe my predecessor was doing that stuff, but I just want to have a quick conversation with my banker. I want to be able to, to go onto a website, or go into a digital banking and, and, mm -hmm. and deal with my bank that way, which is what we used to say in the retail world and even in the small business world. But now that's going that's out. Cool. That's, that's going all the way up to corporates and corporates that's... are asking for that stuff. I've just read an art, just read a study from McKinsey that says, you know, the, the, there is a whole number of smaller corporate organizations that just don't want to deal with a banker. The big, I'm not big surprised. ones still do. I, but... Although I am mostly surprised when, when they get anything right, but this time around, I'm not surprised that that's correct. <laughs> well, it, the data is saying that, right? That, that, that's what the CFOs it's... are saying. So it's, at least they're saying it, whether it's reality well, or not. It is good to hear that it's moving. <laughs> we're still going in the right direction. You seem almost as excited as you were 15 years ago. I don't know how you do that. Um, but I will ask people to find you online and ask you what keeps you excited because I know that you're now with a company that's that's giving you that kind of a that kind of an um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a fodder for uh, for 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 excitement in terms of what they're making as compared to other places. So I'll I'll make sure that people can find you in the intro and there will be a link to your LinkedIn and people you absolutely must stop reading what Alex says and and follow him. But thank you so much for talking to us today we're going to keep it short this uh, the generation we're talking to has shorter thank attention you. spans and we're all neuro spicy so we should probably keep it down but thank you so much for coming over and, and telling us how you felt those early days of fintech thank you alex and hope to have you back soon well thank you so much